Hello and welcome to Beyond the Headlines. I'm Caroline Locker and today we're talking about groundbreaking research in the fight against cancer. With me here I have Concordia professor Vladimir Titorenko. His research has been published in scientific journals around the world and in the mainstream media. In fact, this year he was named as one of the personalities of the year by La Presse and Radio-Canada. Also with me is Professor Thomas Sanderson, who works at the INRS, the Institut Armand Frappier. He also works in cancer research and he's going to help us talk about the significance of this research in the scientific community. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you for inviting us. First off, before we get into the nitty-gritty of the research, could I ask you to describe to us what you do for somebody who doesn't work in the scientific community? So imagine you're at a cocktail party and there are no other scientists in the room and somebody comes up to you and says, what are you working on these days? What do you tell them? Well, my primary research interest is aging. I study how we age. But uh, I study my laboratory in Concordia University doesn't study how humans age, but rather how yeast, those which make beer, cheese, how they age. Yeast, and how yeast ages. How yeast age. So it's one of the direction of our research. Why is that yeast? Just because yeast, pretty much like us, they have exactly the same uh, set up of genes which are responsible for aging. So for a very long time, aging was considered something that just happened like that, with the time, with everyone. There is, nothing, there is no control within our body, how we age, and how fast it will take us to age. But it appears that actually there are a very limited number of genes. You heard of them, DNA, Watson Creek, and so on and so on. Those which are actually very limited number of genes are responsible for defining how long any individual will live. It also depends from some of the you know, food uh, uh, and uh, conditions a person lives, but still. And it appears all of these genes were initially discovered in yeast because they are responsible for aging of yeast. So therefore, it's a great model to study aging. Yeast live very short time couple of weeks in the laboratory conditions. So that means that we can do more and more experiments. So yeast cells develop in a way that's very similar to human cells. Well, in a way, although they definitely look uh, much smaller than <laughs> us, we need a microscope to see them. But sure. otherwise, yes. And this is the same yeast you find in beer and bread, for example. That's right, absolutely. And you study it then because it develops so quickly in a very short amount of time, it helps us do research. That's right. On a shorter, That's in right. a shorter So we time. can change the um, genetic makeup, we can mutate those genes in the laboratory and see how it's uh, affected our lifespan. The ideal case scenario, we're looking for those interventions, say mutations for instance, or a certain type of diet, caloric restriction diet or a dietary restriction call, or some of the, what we will talking about today, also chemical compounds. Mm -hmm. uh, you can call them drugs, although those of them which are natural are not really drugs. Uh -huh. They are natural compounds, uh -huh, uh -huh. which also extend lifespan. Fascinating. So therefore, yeah, we're using yeast and studying uh, all of the different interventions which incre increase their lifespan. Okay. And it's definitely considering the uh, fact that genes responsible for aging in yeast, also responsible for aging in mice at least, in drosophila, practically in any living organism and also in humans, so the, in terms of testing, first step, we test on yeast. That's right. If we get significant yeah. results, we go to mice. Yes. And then, and then next step is humans. Next step would be humans. That's right. Very interesting. Thomas, can I ask you, Thomas Anderson, how do you describe yourself at a cocktail party? Um, I would probably introduce or say that I'm a toxicologist. OK. And, and what are you working uh, on? And then states? that's exactly what they'll ask. So I will say uh, that I study uh, effects of pesticides on the endocrine system in the body. Uh, and more recently, I've also started um, doing studies of natural compounds and what kind of potential beneficial or potentially adverse effects they may have uh, on the endocrine system in the human body. Is there a proven link already by some of these, uh, for example, pesticides on hormonal cancers? Well, there are associations that have been made. Um, the big question is that they've done experiments in animals, for example, and there they do find uh, certain uh, adverse effects on the endocrine system, potentially increasing the risk of developing certain cancers, such as 
mammary tumors. Uh, in humans, however, it's not that clear cut. Okay, hormonal, when we're talking about hormonal cancers, we're talking about which kinds of cancers? Um, hormonal cancers are uh, generally uh, cancers that um, their growth is stimulated by the presence of the natural hormones in the body. For example? For example, uh, breast cancer is, 60% uh, of breast cancers in humans are uh, hormonal, hormone dependent, estrogen dependent. Uh -huh. And then prostate tumors, for example, they're uh, androgen dependent, testicular cancer, um, ovarian cancer, those types of cancers. Okay. Fascinating. Well, let's get right into the nitty gritty of your research. I mean, f well, first of all, you've discovered this acid that we all produce. It's produced by the human liver. It's called? It's called lysocholic acid. Exactly. And Thank it's you. one of the bile acids. They are most commonly known to the general public as a bile acid. And what you've discovered is that this specific acid that we all produce, when the way it reacts with cancer, cancerous cells, it actually kills them. That's right. This is tremendous research for the scientific community, isn't it? Yes, it's a very interesting observation and very kind of promising uh, compounds that can be used in order to treat cancer cells. But what we actually did, uh, without going into story, because obviously it's a very long way, uh, we work, so far we demonstrated that this compound kills cancer cells, different cancer cells, breast cancer cells, neuroblastoma, it's one of the brain tumor, uh, uh, gli glioma cells in petri dish when they culture these cells. So the next step would be, and hopefully with collaboration with Thomas, uh, study whether or not this compound have a similar anti-cancer effect in um, a genetically modified mouse model of cancer. So we're not testing yet on mice, but when you've tested on yeast, this acid that we produce in our liver would kill the cancerous cells. That's right. So what we did, we actually used a robot in order to make the first step. So we have yeast mutants which live extremely short life because it's carry a single mutation in a single gene. And it's live really, really short life. So we were looking into thousands and thousands, or actually a couple of hundred thousand compounds chemical compounds, commercially available, delivered by robot from a very small place into different plates where all these yeast mutants sitting and waiting. And so we were looking specifically for a chemical compound out of this collection of thousands and thousands of different compounds which can restore normal lifespan, greatly increase longevity of yeast. So that was our primary interest. And we discovered many of them, or well, many is about 20, and one group of them, six out of these 20, were compounds which belonged to the group bile acids. Those which absolutely natural compounds produced in our body, in liver, and then released and then used in order to uh, absorb the, the lipids, the fats, uh, out of the bloodstream and deliver them to our body so that it can be used. Mm -hmm. And so then we decided to test this compound and I'm skipping some of the step yes. why. So you uh, narrowed it down to a few, down. to how many different compounds? Oh, well, out of 20, we have a group of six. Then we six tested compounds. them, yeah, we tested them in yeast cells, which of these six is the most uh, patent, the most uh, strong anti-aging effect. And one of these compounds is the lithocholic acid, acid that, that we were and talking about. And because cancer is considered as an age-related disorder, mm -hmm. and unfortunately we all know that, mm -hmm. that it's age-related disorder, we decided then to test whether or not this compound has any anti-cancer effect in cultured human cells recovered from different kinds of cancers. Thomas Sanderson, how significant is this research for the scientific community? Well, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, two striking results, I believe Dr. Uh, Dittorenko uh, found, is uh, first of all, that lithocholic acid can kill certain cancer cells whilst leaving normal cells alone. Uh, of course, this is dose dependent. If you go very high with your concentrations, these the, these bile acids will kill probably other cells as well, but in a lower range, they kill selectively these cancer cells. And the second thing that, is, that I thought was very interesting is, but the lithocholic acid doesn't actually get into the cell. And that's unusual, because usually it, cancer agents work by getting into the cell okay. and doing their so, business there to kill the cell. So, what, so it doesn't get into it, so how, how does it react Well, with that the means cell? that there's some characteristic on the uh, cell surface that these tumor cells have that is making them susceptible to lithocholic acid. And it the, prevents their acid. development and, and their uh, It may trigger uh, cell death, in fact. 
not just stopping them from growing, but actually telling them to and undergo is, a programmed cell death. And this is hugely significant, the fact that it affects cancer cells, it kills the cancer cells, but it doesn't kill normal cells because as we know, one method of, of treating cancer at the moment is chemotherapy. Chemotherapy will kill cancer cells, but it also kills healthy cells, doesn't it? So uh, yes, unfortunately, that, uh, that's a fact. But uh, when they talk about our compounds, yes, not only it doesn't kill normal, non-cancerous cells, but it's actually g uh, making them uh, more resistible to oxidative stress if you add a certain type of oxidative, uh, ex oxidative what, what, Can you explain to that? What does that mean, oxidative Say, stress? Say, uh, you heard about apparently maybe hydrogen peroxide. It's, uh -huh. such, it's not such a scientific term, like really strong yeah. oxidants so that in the uh, you know, beginning of the 20th century, uh, women used to use it in order to um, um, mm, to dye their hair into white yes, color, yes, right? Yes, yes, That's yes. hydrogen peroxide. <laughs> Uh, very strong oxidant, especially uh -huh. if added in certain concentration. So if you add normally to the cells, uh, normal cells, uh, they will be killed in certain concentration. But if you add at the same time lysocholic acid, it's making normal cells much more resistant to this, to this uh, hydrogen peroxide. But at the same time, the compound completely kills cancer cells, especially if you add a certain type of oxidant. So we're now talking about, and this is something that we found with Dr. Thomas, uh, with, sorry, Thomas, uh, very interesting and promising about using maybe perhaps in the future a certain type of combination of compounds, not only lysocholic acid, but in combination with some other, even hydrogen peroxide, or even other known anti-cancer compound in terms of therapy. Thomas Anderson, we're talking about aging and cancer cells. Can you explain to us how aging impacts the development of cancer? Well, actually, that is more, I believe, uh, uh, Vladimir's field, but in general, uh, there's a number of theories, and one of them is uh, accumulation of cellular damage, DNA damage, genetic instability um, over the years that finally results in uh, cells that are in such a state that they'll start proliferating initially slowly, and then through the years, there are various mechanisms that stimulate progression of the tumor. Um, until it finally becomes a tumor that's life-threatening. Uh, Vladimir, you tested thousands, thousands of chemicals for this. How did you pinpoint, how did it come down to this lithocholic acid? Again, we used uh, our best friends yeast in order to discover them. We discovered those, com we were looking and discovered eventually those compounds which increased lifespan of yeast thinking about some anti-aging compounds. Okay, okay? so first, the initial work That's was right. to look at anti-aging, right. not specifically no, we were, ca yeah, killing cancer cells. We were looking cells. only for anti-aging compounds, but when we found those, and we found that they increased the lifespan of yeast by almost three times, wow. that's very significant. We uh, then study how exactly, what they do to yeast cells, inside of yeast cells, uh, what kind of processes they change. And when we understood what kind of processes, we found that actually those processes and they concern the organelle, a powerhouse of the cell called mitochondria. They produce energy, right? But they're also very efficient killers, mitochondria, because they can release molecules which commit cells to a suicide. And so mitochondria are very cell well- Cell suicide. Cell suicide, yeah. So that's uh, kind of uh, almost uh, harakiri cells committing in a very brief time <laughs> because their mitochondria already very well aware that something going really wrong yep. or sometimes out of altruistic reasons mm -hmm. that cells need to be committed, say infected cells for uh -huh, instance, uh -huh, uh -huh. would commit suicide. Uh -huh, uh -huh. But so because we found that mitochondria affected by this anti-aging compound in yeast cells and we thought, first of all, aging is, oh sorry, cancer is a age-related disorder. Mm -hmm. Secondly, mitochondria definitely involved in, right, or in development of cancer, in uh, incidence of cancer. So why don't we just try whether or not our compound has any effect, beneficial on, effect, on killing cancer cells. cells on cancer cells. So that's the way how we go. And it was kind of really complicated. You would never guess that working with yeast, you would uh, even end up with uh, finding a new anti-cancer compound. But that's the beauty of science. Fascinating.
tell me, are there any potential side effects to introducing this kind of acid in, uh, in, in mice and then in humans? There is always, unfortunately, probability of any uh, side effects. Therefore, this But the research, fact that it's a natural compound that we produce, I imagine, right. reduces the but risk of these. It's very important to remember that any compound can be toxic if exceed a certain type of dose, a concentration, right? And the same is true about any magic bullet, right? Any anti-cancer, anti-aging compound they are toxic in, if exceed a certain doses. So it's very important to figure out what are those doses, how to deliver this compound. Many very important questions that need to be addressed. Uh, because yeah, if it exceeds a certain type of critical dose, it can be dangerous, just like aspirin. Yeah, yeah aspirin in, in high doses. I completely uh, agree with, uh, with mm -hmm. Vladimir. Because uh, I, I study natural compounds. Mm -hmm. And um, in fact, yes, they are they have beneficial effects at lower concentrations, but generally at higher concentrations, some of them can be very toxic. Um, which again, which when you're thinking of natural supplements that you buy in the store and take, uh, there's a certain dose that is probably beneficial. Mm -hmm. Just taking more and more and more mm -hmm. uh, will either not help or actually have adverse effects. Or be detrimental. You work in hormonal cancers. Are hormonal cancers on the rise generally? Uh, generally, they are on the rise um, in the Western populations. In the Western populations? In the Western populations. And probably a, a big factor in that is, uh, is diet. Diet. So is that something that you're looking at, the way diet can influence hormones and therefore I, uh, trans yes, hormonal cancers? Yes, yes. Uh, I don't look at diet, um, but I look at certain compounds that are present in uh, fruits and vegetables. Uh, for example, um, consumption of uh, certain vegetables such as broccoli and Brussels sprouts. And, uh, they have beneficial effects. They seem to have anti-cancer properties. People mm -hmm. eat a lot of that and, and skip the red meat. Antioxidants. Um, have lower incidences of cancer. Yes, there's antioxidants in there. Um, and there are also compounds in there that may not necessarily be antioxidants, but they act in the cells um, uh, to uh, protect them either from DNA damage. Uh, it can be via an antioxidant effect. It can also be via uh, increasing the, uh, the effectiveness of uh, DNA repair. Uh, and then we also find uh, natural compounds that are relatively safe to healthy cells, but kill cancer cells. Fascinating. Vladimir, what can you learn from each other's research? We learn a lot because obviously our expertise, scientific expertise, is uh, complementing each other. So therefore, uh, you know, I learned already from Thomas uh, a lot of things which are very beneficial. Not only that, we also have some other compounds, anti-aging compounds, other than lysacolic acid. So eventually, one day, perhaps, we will also work on those other compounds, mm -hmm. which are quite different by structure. Now, for this particular research, you worked in collaboration with the University of Saskatchewan and That's with right. McGill University. Yeah. How generally, how do these collaborations come about? These collaborations come out, of, well, in, 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 in our case, it was, I just knew about the existence of these researchers, about the outstanding research. Uh, in one case, uh, from McGill University, from the literature, as well from my graduate students, who used to be undergraduate students during summer working in one of the lab. And the other researcher, I know him personally, when I was doing my postdoctoral training in Edmonton. Uh, but also from the literature, obviously. Uh, and I also heard about Thomas from the literature as well, but then Alex, uh, my former students, uh, has introduced us. So therefore, it's, you know, it's a small world in science when the researchers know, know each other, mostly by their work. Uh, and it's all, it seems to be all building blocks, isn't it? You're doing your research on yeast, and then that's right. at the, when yeah. you get to the next step and you want to this test it on mice, you need somebody who has the facility. modern science that this is extremely integrated, and if we really want to do a certain type of uh, step further on into understanding, this is extremely integral part of the research. As you can see, I'm mostly biologist, chemical biologist, who is studying a certain type of aspect at the same time, definitely in order to do the next step into uh, all animals, like mm -hmm. mice, uh, definitely expertise of, of Thomas is absolutely important. And uh, also an important thing that comes out of this is that uh, even though we have labs that are doing very different things, 
uh, we somehow found each other uh, to work on a specific project together uh, where we just have that little bit of overlap. And for me, it's, um, I believe it's important, uh, especially when funding agencies are thinking of funding labs, um, that uh, there's a lot of diversity in the types of research that is done. There tends to be a tendency with the cutbacks to focus on certain, let's say, hot areas of research. But you don't really know what the hot area of research is going to be mm -hmm. in a few years' time. Thomas, you're of Dutch origin, and Vladimir, you were born in, in Russia, or the USSR as, as it was then. I wonder how you have an international background. How does Canada uh, rate in terms of cancer research? Is Canada seen as a, a leader in cancer research? Uh, I would say one of the leaders, but maybe it's more Thomas who more... Uh, I think uh, Canada is, uh, is competing quite well. Uh, I'm looking, of course, at the, the track record from, you know, over the last 30 years. Uh, yeah, Canada is a very big player in research. Which country is the, is the leader, the world leader in cancer research? Well, uh, the United States does the most research and also comes, comes usually out with, uh, with most of the, uh, the new findings. Um, I think Canada plays, uh, is, high, is high up there in medical research. Vladimir, as a scientist, what is your hope for this specific research that you've done on yeast? Where do you hope it may lead? Well, uh, you know, uh, ideally it would lead to uh, the compounds that we discovered being really anti-cancer compounds that would act in human body in this way. So that's maybe uh, the dream and the destination and uh, that would be the top result, something that uh, would be extremely pleasant. And uh, after all, you know, all this finding, research finding, by federal and other sources is done in order to improve the health and uh, increase the longevity of people. Mm -hmm. uh, so therefore, that would be the most rewarding results, obviously. Uh, although as scientists, we're always looking into uh, solving scientific problems, which luckily, solving scientific problems uh, coincide with uh, a certain benefits for society, yes, as it course. should be. Thomas Sanderson and Vladimir Titarenko, thank you very much for joining us today and thank you all for watching Beyond the Headlines. I'm Caroline Locker. Goodbye. <laughs>